So, um, I'm Steve Lewis. I'm going to be talking about uh, several projects that are running in Seattle in collaboration with other places throughout the world, largely looking at technologies that are of interest to the third world. Um, <coughs> my email is smlewis and lordjo.com, and I recently started working at the Institute for Systems Biology, which maybe in another year I'll tell you about. Um, <laughs> Once he figures out what it is, <laughs> uh, there's a, there is a lot of that. <laughs> very, very, very heavy genomic stuff. It's the first. It's the first place I've ever been where we thought that 30, 30 gigabytes was a small file. Uh, so, basically, everybody in this room knows that um, information technology from the Altair and the things that came before it, to the Apple II, to the PC, you know, to Windows and, and Macintosh, to the internet, has made major, major changes in our lives. Um, but it's interesting to think that those technologies have not really penetrated many places in the third world. And even simple technologies such as a wired phone have not reached many villages in many places. And um, the efforts that I'm going to talk about are looking at technologies which are appropriate for the third world and start by realizing that the constraints that we deal with in these situations are vastly different from the constraints that we're dealing with in a wired, highly technological place such as Seattle. So some of the challenges you have to deal with, um, and I'll talk about each of these in, in detail. You have to worry about connectivity, which may very well not be there. You have to worry about something as simple as power, service, money is a huge problem, and even literacy can be a major issue. Connectivity. Uh, you think about places like India and Africa and Vietnam, and villages out there will tend not to be wired. And we're not even talking about telephone, simple power if they have it, is likely to come from generators. So any connectivity is going to be a problem. Now what has been happening in the last 10 or 15 years is that wireless is making a huge impact in these areas because wireless technology is sufficiently cheap and requires sufficiently little infrastructure that it can actually be deployed in the third world. If you think about the effort of wiring up a country like we did in the 1930s when we wired up many of the farms, that's just not going to happen out there. But cell phones are really available globally and are the connections that we need to think about. And of course, even cell phone connectivity is going to be unreliable. So you can have connectivity, you just might not count on it at any point in time or even at any day in time. Power is likely to be a problem. This is what power systems look like in many cities. This is very similar to some shots that I took in New Delhi. and. Um, Looks like a Chicago. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no it's much more Chicago. Beside the donkey. Yeah. The, donkey. Yeah. the difference, you know, the difference the donkey. is that, <laughs> yeah, <it's in> Chicago. <laughs> the difference is that in Chicago, they actually have to get permits for those lines. <laughs> um, the power, even if it is available, you're likely have to have to deal with blackouts and brownouts 
So the power won't be good, it won't be on at all times, a two hour UPS is not going to save you during a six hour blackout, which is the kind of thing that you'll find in Iraq and many other countries. Um, you can't assume that servicing will be available. There are the groups at the university left um, desktop computers in villages, and they came back several months later and discovered that the machines were gathering dust. They had broken. Nobody knew how to fix it. Nobody knew how to get parts, and the machines were not being used. So you can't assume that parts are available. You can't assume that if parts are available, the knowledge to take the system apart and put it together and systems are very likely to sit around and be unused. Did everybody notice the picture, by the way? The <laughs> it's a PC. It's a PC. That was taken by a Mac guy I wanted to <laughs> <laughs> um, Money is a huge issue. Um, the cost of a laptop is comparable with the yearly income in many countries. Um, on the other hand, cell phones, which I'm going to talk a lot about, can be gotten extremely cheaply. In India, you can buy a cell phone for $12. That's still a lot of money in, in many places in India, and it's very typical that if you think about a village, you're likely to find one woman with the village cell phone, and that is her job, is to manage the cell phone and the accounts and provide communications for the entire village. Um, I love this picture on the right, which sort of uh, emphasizes the digital divide. Does he have a toy cell phone there? No, he has a block of wood. But he's pretending it's, he's a, pretending it's okay. a cell phone. <laughs> he knows what the one is then. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when, when, when you send uh, workers out, you can usually assume that the people that you were sending out are literate, but the people that they are talking to may well not be literate. And if you have people in the villages having to fill out forms, you may have to think about things which are not written, uh, either using voice or heavily using pictures or in some way start thinking about literacy being an issue because in the third world, universal literacy cannot be assumed and as the picture on the right shows you, we can even worry about literacy in this country. <laughs> Power camera on. <laughs> so, which device is going to have an impact on the third world? Will it be the, the desktop PC, even the PC in a form which is heavily <coughs> designed for third world use? The cell phone. Or is it going to be the cell phone? And the answer, of course, is the cell phone. It has many advantages. The cell phone is extremely portable. It is cheap and it is getting cheaper. Now it is true that most of the applications that I'm going to describe are applications that run on the Android, which today is not a very cheap phone, but thinking a few years out, the Android is going to be in the same class as those $12 phones that you can get in India today. Shenzhen, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> yes, they might well be. And this is something. Who sells them. <laughs> yeah. You know, as an aside, I have always thought that what Google should do is a launch a geosynchronous satellite to provide connectivity to internet connectivity to Indonesia. B built in a huge amount of extra capacity for, say, about a billion people. 
and C, get the CIA to pay for it. And oh, by the way, order a bunch of devices from China. <laughs> and make sure that the pricing structure is just set enough to tempt people to make pirate copies. <laughs> um, and of course, the other thing to do is to get the CIA to fund all of this. So you government fund the larger infrastructure, and yeah. then the, the knockoff market uh, develops the entire... Uh, the, China, the Chinese pirate and distribute it, distribute it to the China, and it would be a classic example of a, country, of a company declaring war on a country <laughs> and using information as a weapon. <laughs> all right, that's an aside. Um, back to cell phones. Um, cell phones solve problems of intermittent and rarely available power. They can run for days on batteries that can be charged from solar devices, from bicycle generators, from the kinds of power sources which could be readily and cheaply available anywhere. Um, they automatically solve the problem of connectivity because that's what a cell phone does. So if you have a computer, even the one laptop per child, it had a lot of connectivity <coughs> and it could make a wireless connection with any hotspot in the village. And the problem, of course, is you don't have a hotspot in the village. And if you had a hotspot in the village, you would still have the problem of how to connect it to anything, because you probably don't have a wire going to the village. And furthermore, it is sealed, it is self-contained, it is rugged, and it tends to be very, very reliable. I might have one more thing. Yeah. It has apps, or could have apps. Oh yes. Yeah. They're, now that they're smart, they're right. you can you can put stuff in, and that's which where it would have, which effectively gets away from that. Oh. Right. So the moral is that today, when you think about the wave of the future in computing, mobile devices are going to be a major component of that wave. But in the third world. Mobile devices are the only widely available computing devices. And so the effective solutions you want to consider today in the third world need to consider the cell phone as a primary platform. So let's think about a typical third world problem. Um, fishermen go out off the coast of India and they catch fish in boats that we would probably consider comparable with a large rowboat, and um, with motor force. And now they have to decide where they're going to deliver the fish. Here. Can answer this. Um, shut this down. Um, they have to decide where to deliver the fish. So if the fish, if the fishermen head into a port and discover that there are no buyers, the value of their cargo is, for all practical purposes, zero. Because there is no refrigeration, you can't keep it, and you have to unload it at whatever price people will take. And conversely, if there are lots of buyers and no fishermen, they will pay a very high price and tend not to end up with fish. So uh, this is sort of hard to see, but over the during the late 90s, cell phone technology started spreading along the coast of India. And it spread basically from the south to the north. And there was a group that looked at the price of fish <coughs> over time, the daily price, during this period. So what you see on the left, which is before phones came in, is that the price of fish tended to vary wildly because the fishermen really had no way of connecting up with the buyers and even knowing which port to head into. And as cell phone came in, which is cell phones came in, which is the dark line, all of a sudden the price of fish stabilized. The study of course had a lot of statistics, but it's one of those wonderful things where you can just look at the chart and say, <laughs> well, think it's it is change. blazingly yeah. obvious that this technology has made a huge difference to the lives of a lot of people. <clears throat> so it's, it's a very simple 
example of how something as simple as communications can be a really big deal. So, the group I'm going to talk about, there's a group at the University of Washington called Change, which is looking at technologies which are appropriate to the third world. And um, one of these technologies, which I talk a lot about, is the Open Data Kit. And the reason that I'm here talking about these technologies is it's a collaboration between the University of Washington, a lot of smart people at Google, and it's all written in Java. What phone is wrong? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. So, a lot of the ideas were to move away from paper. You know, we have, in this country, we have largely, but not completely, moved away from paper decades ago, except perhaps in the medical field, which is another story which we won't get into. But in Africa, this really hasn't happened. And um, if you think about community health workers in places like Kenya, Tanzania, where they're dealing with a massive epidemic in AIDS and, and other diseases, you send out people to the villages, look around, talk to people, give advice, track uh, things that are going on, and um, you want to educate people. And yet, the technology they use currently is ancient technology. There are paper forms, there's little or no training, there's little or no ways to disseminate new protocols, new information, and if the paper ever gets back to a central office, and if it does, it is probably coming back on something like a donkey cart. It is likely to pile up for months or years before anybody gets around to processing it or collating it or even looking at it. So you really want a system where people go out and as they, you know, as new things are developed in the capital, goes out to the workers, and as workers get data, it immediately comes back to a central location without going through the paper step. And of course, the technology is to get them some focus. And they are specifically looking at applications that run on the Android, which is a smart enough phone and a capable enough phone to do the kinds of things they're after. So they standardize the data. They can pull the data in, aggregate it in the central location. And there is something which I'm going to talk more about later on, which is the open MRS system, open medical records. It was largely developed in East Africa. And it's an open system for doing medical records on a server with a lot of the te same technologies they're using for the Android. The groups cooperate very closely. And it allows them to have medical records which they could never afford any other way. Um, and of course, the health worker and a phone, you can do protocols, you can do better training, you can track outbreaks because you don't have to bring the data back in, a, in an ops cart, and you can look at diseases better. So, the technology is the open data kit, which is going to use a lot of open source technologies, which I talk about, but it's basically running on the Android. It's a standard form, plus everything that a cell phone does. GPS pictures, barcode readers, video audio. And while it was developed for public health, it has been used in a number of other applications, and I'm going to talk about some of these later on. It's currently deployed they say in Uganda and Kenya, but in fact, it's deployed at a number of sites. And what it consists of is a large variety of applications, but I am going to concentrate on the upper three. ODK Collect is the form that runs on the Android 
collects data and in turn transmits it to a receiver on the Google App Engine running ODK at gate. And of course, submit is the protocol that these two draw back. So it's an in, there's a lot of infrastructure, not all of which we're going to go into. There's some databases, but the trick is it's a way to send somebody out in the field with a form that they've downloaded on their phone, get the data, send it back to a server, and do so with relatively <coughs> little technology other than the phones themselves. How do they recruit people who are working in these countries? What? How do they recruit people? Um, I believe they pay them. <laughs> uh, this is... A, the, the, the health workers, and I'm not an expert on, on this, but I think that these are government programs where people are sent out to the villages by the health ministry. And um, I do think that the money to support the phones may in some part come from the government, but I think that's definitely subsidized by organizations here. Uh, it's not uh, yours, it's Sorry. Yes. That's me. No, it's his. That's me, and I am about to shut it down and tell it to <laughs> your dark shadow. <laughs> okay. Just a second. Uh, I turn off my phone, which I should have done earlier. Silent mode. And of course, all of these open standards are in. Java, and we'll talk about many of these in more detail. The point of this is there's a lot of code that's in use. It's all open source. It's all Java. And these kinds of projects, when you, again, it, it's another thing that you need to think about in this environment is you don't want to use proprietary software. They really can't afford to barely afford to pay for hardware in the third world, which they have to pay for. But open source is, is absolutely critical because there's not just not the money to pay for software. <clears throat> and furthermore, it's good software and it allows you to bring in a lot of developers like the people in this room to uh, help develop good reliable systems. Anybody in this room is qualified to work on any of these technologies and to make significant contributions to this project. Okay. ODK Collect is a tool which runs on top of XForms, and I'm going to say more about XForms in a second, but it uses Java Rosa, which is an XForms engine designed for mobile. So it uses a somewhat limited XML <coughs> parser in order to parse the XForms and to build up the internal representations of the data that we're going to be displaying. So what are XForms? Um, it's a standard developed by W3C for doing forms in XML. Uh, an XForm might look something like this where you have on the left-hand side a description of what the form is. And I'll go over what those things are in more detail when I start talking about the ODK version of this. And then on the right-hand side, you see what appears on the page. So you describe the data that you're going to collect and the ways that you're going to present it in XML. You can present the data, and then what submit will do is generate an XML document containing the reply. That is, in this case, first name or F name is equal, is the value of F name is whatever you enter in the field, the value of L name is whatever you enter into the field. This becomes an XML document that you can send to a server or anything else that can consume XML data. So the whole thing can be done in XML and all the work on in a system with a browser is done by the browser. On a cell phone, yeah? Foundation as well? 
The what? Is there validation available in this standard? There is some validation. One of the things, uh, some of the tags that you can add, um, I'll show you some of the validation tags. You can, you can add tags which say that a particular field is required for numeric fields you can add tags specifying a minimum and a maximum value. Um, Nothing like regex. You may, you may, you may be able. You can specify some expressions, and I'm not sure how complex the expressions can be. Um, one of the other things that you can do that I will show later on is um, you can make the display or the use of certain sections of the form conditional on previous answers. And that's used very extensively in the ODK when you're only showing one question on the screen at a time. And you just don't see the questions that are not conditional. <coughs> This page simply shows, if I can pull them up, um, that the forms, this is from the Oberon site, which has a form builder, and it merely shows you that, particularly in a browser, there are a number of controls that are available that you can add in exports. What you can do on a cell phone is a subset of what you can do in a browser, but it's a pretty rich subset of things that are available. The tree controls are not available. The radio buttons are. Um, you have essentially single and multiple selectors, some images. Are those uh, native date components, fields. or are they rendered in JavaScript or something? Um, there is an Xforms driver, which browsers tend to have for the most part, these are the controls. So Java Rosa is an engine which supports a subset of what you can do in XForms on mobile devices. Um, in Java Rosa applications, typically you get one question at a time on the screen because that's all the real estate you have available. It supports a lot of phones and it's written largely to the Java ME standard. Um, the Open Data Kit is an Android library that works with Java Rosa and supports the standard controls as well as all the phone stuff. And there's a barcode picture, GPS video, and the ability to upload to an associated server. Now, I want to say a little bit about the Android, and I think that is my next slide, yes. Um, the Android. Uh, incidentally, some of us have Androids. I'm going to pass one around to uh, give you a sense for what they look like. This is something, by the way, that Google gave out at their Google I.O. conference. Several of you took. You know, this is. These are the. These are the things I'm going to be talking about running on the Android. So I'll pass that around. Um, Google actually is pretty happy to give people who look like they're going to write uh, Android applications, Android phones. And uh, several of us who've been to the Android course discovered that at the end of it, they said they would send us phones. I haven't gotten mine yet. Have well, I haven't gotten mine either. So. All right. And hopefully they're not going to say you can only write apps in Java, right? Uh, what apps would you like them in? Right, why would you want? I'm just teasing. <laughs> um, you one know of, what well, Jobs did. I, you know, one of the things, one of the things that is interesting on the Android that I will mention. What the next slide is going to say, by the way, 
is is really what I want to talk about for a little while, which is the Android should be on your radar. Androids run a full JDK 1.6. This is not any. This is this is the real deal. Um, the Android that I'm passing around is feels like a kind of like a cell phone. It's a little bit slow. It's a little bit clunky, but <laughs> The Google phone, the Nexus, is, yes, it's fast, it's got some gorgeous, uh, you know, it's gorgeous applications, great processor, and um, it's nothing to be ashamed of. The platform's open source, Eclipse and IntelliJ both have good Android plugins. They have an excellent emulator. You could debug most of what you're doing on the Android using an emulator running on the PC. Well, I'm, going to show, I'm going to show all, all the stuff that I would show on the Android. I'm going to show it on the emulator because I don't know how to project an Android. But, How's uh, that the emulator works? A while back I tried it. It was so slow. It is slow. Yeah, yeah it is actually, it's actually running on top of VirtualBox. Still, it's unacceptably slow. Yeah, I mean, for my for the inner development I've been doing, I just tether my phone, and the, I mean the it, the the ability to like just ship it stuff onto your phone and debug it right there is so seamless that how'd you lose it? You don't you know unless you want to do something like this, you really don't need the emulator if you have a phone. I mean, the only reason you want the emulator is to be able to try out different screen sizes and stuff like that. But debugging on your phone works great. Steve, how much memory are they working with there? Uh, it was so space. frustrating. In yeah. Yeah, I, can, I can believe. I, I believe it. I, I tried out. Yeah, I tried out the emulator, and I didn't like it. It's a little faster now, and it's definitely faster if you use like Linux. Oh, yeah. Oh, all right. Yeah. Well, they always use Linux internally. Right. Even so, though, I mean, on a you know, on a one, I mean. Sure, this is a, a low-end machine these days, but on a 1.6 gigahertz machine under Ubuntu, I found the, the emulator very, very bogey. Yeah, and most, yeah. Of the, most of the time, the emulator, I've noticed in startup, once it's up and running. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's That was the problem, is it was just like took forever to start. All the yeah. You don't have to go off and do that. You don't, oh. have, no, no, you the, don't have to the start the emulator, emulator every time. Forget your app. The jitting your app is, is not what slows it down. Right. It's, it's the actual it's set it, up already. I don't know what it lost to get the emulator going, but there's a ton of stuff around it, and it has to simulate its uh, phone connection and its Wi-Fi well, connection. Well, and it's, simu and blah, blah, blah. it's simulating an ARM processor. Oh, yeah, and it's simulating. I mean, that's, that's right there is the unfortunate. Yeah, the first time we did it, I thought it was going to be Me too, yeah. <laughs> Go get large. Well, yeah, it's the, 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 well what you need to know when you're developing yeah, applications yeah. is that once you start up the emulator, you don't have to shut it down. You can just ship a new copy of the application out. Yeah. That's pretty fast. And the app will come back up quick. Right. Yeah. Yes. If the app is, is doing things that are very complicated, and nothing I'm talking about here is complicated enough to seriously stress even the emulator. Um, but if it is doing seriously complicated things, you <coughs> might want to think about debugging on the phone. But the real thing that's time consuming about the emulator is just bringing it up the first time. Just leave it running all the time, and it's fine. It seems a Did they finally fun. open the, the Bluetooth stack? Um, you mean? Well, it used to be a. Uh, there is a Bluetooth, but no public API. I don't know. How about now? Uh, never played with Bluetooth. Anybody? Uh, Wilhelm, you. I haven't, I haven't delved into Bluetooth. I'm just still getting up to speed on the basic stuff. I, it was for me. It was like a, really. I got this phone just to develop a uh, you know, mm -hmm. little Bluetooth application for the, the Lego Mindstorm mm -hmm. with my son. <laughs> All right. And discovered that it didn't open the Bluetooth API. Well, they don't want so you hooking up to like a, a, a network device. Mm -hmm. so you don't pay them or something. Or? No, 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 it's just no, no, Bluetooth it's, or something. The, I think they Wi-Fi. Like, they prefer the Wi-Fi or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Actually, Constantine, I'm just looking at their API, and they do have an Android Bluetooth package. So I know like there's been a lot of change. Yeah, I think that's that's the G1, right? You have. Yep. 
Yeah, and that's, that's 1.6. Like, I believe there's, there was big changes between 1.6 and 2.0. Yeah. Maybe the hardware wasn't done and they just didn't want to open it up. No, it, well, the GP was available. Or it was something like that. Kind of a working because it supports the Bluetooth uh, headsets, stuff like that. Right? And the yeah, I mean, the impression that I've got from my own online research, research was that that 2.0 is like the first really good delivery of Android. The previous, there, it, was, it was very beta. And with 2.0, they really tighten things, things up. <laughs> so they're one version ahead. I, I'm just going to say, it seems ironic that the emulator actually needs to run huh. Java on the emulator. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're going to emulate the whole thing, you got yeah. it. Yeah, because they don't, so that this is the other interesting thing, and I haven't haven't dug into, you know, what, what exactly it all means in practical terms, but they have their own very specialized VM called Dalvik, um, and it actually has, uh, at least according <coughs> to the reading I've been doing, it has performance characteristics that are distinctly different from the the Sun VM and you know the IBM VMs that we're all. And it also doesn't to. use the same class file format. It actually right. is all compact and, and simplified and. Uh, um, you know, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, all the all, as Steve says, all the JDK 1.6 APIs that you would want are there, uh, but the the actual runtime is is very much its own thing. It, what it means is you can't just drop a jar on an Android and expect to uh, yeah, load it and use it because it's going to use a totally different format for the jar and for the bytecodes. You know, you're going to have to compile it in with the application and in Dalvik in some. One of the things that, by the way, one of the things, before we leave the Android, um, you know that uh, Jobs has sworn that there would never be uh, scripting on the iPhone, which of course includes Java and JavaScript and lots of other things, but there is a scripting API for the Android, which allows you to script most of the things that are available, which is, uh, I have just started to play with it. It's, it's kind of cute. So is that is that sorry? Is that like a, a scripting API that they provided that you can use different scripting languages on top of, kind of like they used to have for the JVM, or is it its own custom level? Like? It. I will. They they support a number of scripting languages, and I'm trying to remember. I think JavaScript is one of them. Okay. Um, Bean Shell. Okay, so it is a one that they support. Yeah. Cool. It's built on the JVM and it allows you, you know, it has the standard interpret in some Six. scripting language. I don't, you know, I can't, I wasn't prepared to talk about that. So I can't tell you, but there's a list of scripting languages that they, that they support. And every once in a while they will add new ones. The other curious thing is there's already uh, jo uh, VM languages on the VM that are already ported. Uh, um, Scala? Like, no. J yeah, Ruby. didn't we see Scala? Um, J Ruby. Yeah, and so J Ruby yeah. and uh, right. so, yeah. Well, so what the, what the guy, I read the Scala article, and what the guy did, and, and it actually makes sense in practice, because I was like, okay, you can do Scala, <laughs> but you know, I was looking at the size of the Scala runtime, but if you take, you know, you take, your, take whatever your favorite language is, you know, develop your app in that, and then use, um, one of the stripping tools that you know goes through your jar files and strips out all the APIs you didn't call. And the example Scala application, um, after the uh, after it was stripped, the the Scala runtime only added about 250k overhead, which is still a little bit chunky. But these days, it's actually not that bad when you know applications are weighing in at one or two megs. You know, if, if you get enough. Acceleration out of using the language of your choice, you know, why not? Why not accept that you're going to be slightly larger than you would be if you did it in base Java? Yeah. How much memory are extra on the phones you're playing with? Anybody? I'm not 100 percent sure. 20, 30 megs or a gig? Oh, you're talking. You're talking storage. Ram. A oh, ram. Boot up. Yeah. 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 Um. 30. 30 on megs. G1. 30 I, megs. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know about the G1. I, I haven't actually looked at the numbers. You can almost boot an app server in there. <laughs> it's getting close. Actually, yeah, uh, on that topic, 
I know J-Boss was booting on device tool. J-Boss? Yeah, J-Boss in <laughs> <laughs> They were doing that. They were playing with it. I'm like, why, guys? What are you now you know why. Because yeah. now you can run it. On a, just Jay to say they did it. Just say that uh, phone passed uh, compatibility when uh, you will be able to deploy WebSphere. <laughs> I wouldn't wish that any better. Every phone costs ten grand now. Yeah. <laughs> Are we per quarter? All right. Per quarter, per Android per and Android should be another meeting. We should have a meeting on the Android. Anyway. Or Android. Okay. Um, demonstration. Oh, yes. Demonstration. Yeah, Droid has two fifty six, which is the Verizon one that's very similar to the Nexus one. That's extra or boot up? No. Uh, well, that's the t that's the total that's the total, total RAM. To play with, yeah. yeah. That's a lot. Play with. Device that's okay. So with ODK Collect, you choose from N fours. <coughs> In this case, I have one which I've developed, and it takes. The first time you run it, it just takes a few minutes, and then, oh, the way that you, Android does not, you're multi-touch with your Android, don't you? Yeah. Okay. The older ones did, uh, and that was not because they didn't know how to do it, mm -hmm. it was because they were afraid that Apple was Well, in fact, sick. when I first got this, it, it didn't, and then I was actually waiting for the hacked ROMs to come out. <laughs> and before the hack ROM even came out, Google was like, okay, it's time. Let loose the dogs of war and shipped an update with multi touch enabled. So you have that 2.1, right? Uh, yeah, they, they, it's in 2.1. So the hardware was there, it's just they forgot to tell you. That was no, it's not that they forgot to tell you. It was, it was, I, think it was, I think it was very deliberate. It was like they were not yet ready you know, to, to face the Apple lawsuit. And so then the boys at the, the uh, intellectual property office said, yes. it's a go. And yeah. they just <laughs> <laughs> I guess I guess they're ready now that it has already happened. Yeah. <laughs> but one of the and things that I was going to say is even them. on the older Androids before they had multi-touch, they had the concept of gestures. And a gesture is you do something with your finger like you, you know, swipe is very common, just drag it across the screen and it causes something to happen. But you could also run it in a circle, and there's a gesture detector that allows you to define gestures and causes things to happen in your application. The common gesture in the Android is the swipe, click and drag. And um, you bring up questions in the form. Now, I've set up this form um, quite deliberately to start off in Spanish to show that there are multiple languages supported. Using a slightly different scheme than we're used to in Java, by the way. Right. We'll, we'll show you that, too. Um, actually, I'm, I will say very little about the technology I used to build the form, because it was one of what I saw as one of the critical weaknesses, that is they didn't have tools to build the form. And so the languages part actually went to pro standard property bundles and then got <coughs> recompiled in the proper form for the XML because we've got good tools for dealing with property bundles. So you enter your form, you start your next question, you decide that you really prefer to do this in English, so you change your language to English. Yeah. Right. And, um, <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> yes, <Hello>. yes. How about, yeah. Oh, yes. I, I had to make sure that the male <laughs> questions were at least as embarrassing as the female questions. Um, <laughs> we'll go back to the female questions in a bit. Like, Where are the pictures? <laughs> no, 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 no. F1 for help. Where's not sure? All right, actually, actually let's, let's go ahead and change this answer. Um, <laughs> So uh, anyway, well, one right. of these for my health form. To right. yeah. 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 <laughs> How, you know, in health forms, you just have to ask lots of embarrassing questions. It's just the way the world works. Um, the interesting thing is that one of the things that I just showed you is that the questions that you see can depend on the answers 
to previous questions. So you can organize your form. You know, if you are, um, you know, if you're a female, you get certain questions. If you're a male, you get certain questions. I had one which I'm not going to show you where, you know, you ask what a developer what languages he used, and if he said, uh, you know, Visual Basic, then you could start asking some very elementary questions. <laughs> <laughs> lots of pictures. Right. With lots of pictures. Yeah, lots of, with lots of, with, 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 with lots of pictures. Um, does this have the ability to bring up pictures too? Yes. Okay. I have not done so, but you do have the ability to bring up pictures. So do you have a rash that looks like this or something? You, I mean, physically you could show yes. them, they could compare and compare. Is all this in XML? Like the, the prepositional logic? Everything is in XML okay. and I'll show you what the XML looks like in a bit. Who would know? Yes. Can you do a deconditional logic or can you do something more than that? Um, there are, it supports expressions. You know, the expressions are XPath kinds of expressions. And um, what are you thinking about? Well, I mean, simple things like loops, for example, or just being able to modify parts of the form dynamically or something like that. Just a second. Like Let's go on. Um, I don't know on Mac. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> I told you we had to, you know, you have to do embarrassing questions on a, on a health <coughs> Okay, now, this is the child section. Uh, okay. So, you know, do you want to add a child? Yes. What's his name? I wasn't sure what pronoun to use. There, there, I actually, in my logic, there's, you know, in my builder, there's a pronoun <coughs> thing that you set because it generates the questions if you don't want to write them out. But anyway. It will go through, and in this case, it finishes, you know, female, whatever. So I'm noticing that your fields don't seem to know that they're numeric. Um, the, you know, it's a very, there was a lot of discussion about that, and I, you know, I think there's a way to get, you know, I'd set that up as a, as a numeric field, but it somehow doesn't work right, and I think that they're fixing it in the later version up the numeric keypad. Um, you know, add oh, is that what you were expecting? Is it to pop the numeric keypad? See, sorry. Okay. And this is this is a date widget. And and each enter or, or form submit is doing a round trip on a wireless connection. Or oh is no! Some sort of no. Server? It's all internal. It's all internal. It's all internal. Like it's XML document. And then it'll send it. Okay. Good. Very handy. Okay. So, so you can store the XML forms for when you have. This is, this, is, this is, of course, a multiple select just Michael. to prove that we can do it. And now we can save the form. And we have not yet sent it out a wireless okay. connection. What we have done is we now have the, um, we now can review our data or we can send the data. And if I've set up the server properly, which I don't know if I did for this emulator, we should be able to send it to something running on the Google App Engine. So you up so, so what's running there? Is it all in a mono, no, mono well, maybe not. app, or is this a little server back there that this form thing is chatting to? Um, what happens is it's all a mono app, but when you have connectivity, and remember, if you're thinking about trekking around the bush in Africa, right. connectivity is something which Africa. might not be readily available. So the whole idea was to save everything, and when you can connect, upload it, and the server is running on Google App Engine, and this is talking directly to a server on Google App Engine to the standard, standard internet connection. So that's our ODK demo. So, there are four elements to the form. There's a language section which just defines all of the text as keys that will be used in other places. There's an instance section which describes the structure of the data. There's a binding section which is the annotation and all of the logic. 
then there's an input section which describes the controls. So the language section will look something like this. You have an identifier, uh, which is any random text which you're going to use later on to refer to the value, and then a series of translation sections in uh, four various languages, in this case, English and German, some of which had to be escaped into uh, Unicode form. But um, this is the way you would do would, you, would do all of the languages. On a larger form, these will get significantly larger. Um, now, a little aside why, on languages. Yes? Why languages are not the EM, ES, whatever, the standard yeah. Java things? Why? Like, so those are big, even well, bigger than Java, but they're not associated with Java. Built into one six. Um, yes, but we're building this on X forms, which may not necessarily, you know, you may not even have Java. So you don't even want resource bundles or anything there. You just want to do it. In they want to do that all in XML because that's what X forms does. What I did, as I say, internally what I'm doing is I'm setting up the resource bundles because I can support them. And then when I generate the XML, and which any sane person would do, I read the resource bundles and simply um, generate the necessary XML. Yes. But regardless of Java, though, as was mentioned, why aren't they using the ISO standards? The the, the name of English should be E N, and yeah, the X name of, uh, of, of, of German should be D E. So that, so, but that's what gets displayed on the screen, though, right? Uh, I believe it is. Yes. So that's probably why, because right. people would ask, "What's E N?" Right. Oh, oh, I see. I see. Yes, yeah. because you remember the menu that popped up those Template. languages? Right. It's not an HTML, it's done. Right. Um, now on the side. Uh, machine translation has actually gotten not bad <coughs> in recent years. You shouldn't use machine translation uh, unaided, but in a pinch, it is a whole lot better than nothing. And there's a very nice API that Google has, which will automatically translate from one language to another. And it does a pretty respectable job. And what I'm doing these days, and, and, and I really recommend this for, for, for people who are doing multilingual, is at least use the automatic translation to generate the first cut of your bundles. Then somebody can take a look at them and you know the work they have to do to change what an automatic engine gives to have what is truly the right answer is a whole lot less work and a whole lot easier than having to generate it all from scratch. And the code to translate an array of strings from one language to another is essentially those four lines. It's an API that Google provides. They have a little jar with a translate class, and you set a refer, and the one I have in this slide will work just fine. Um, they just want to know who's calling them. And you set up a couple of ports and pass it an array of strings and get an array of strings back. Answers are pretty bloody good. Um, so, you know, it, this is something that, that, that I've started to do in several places, and I've really started to like the idea to, to let the machine do the first cut. And of course, in the third world, multilingual is absolutely critical. You just need to support. Um, okay, the instance section defines the structure of your XML, and one of the things to note here is, in this case, the the questions, particularly the female questions and the more, and the male questions, are um, separate groups. So groups are just in terms of the structure of the XML tags, in the sense of defining the structure of the language, and the child 
shows that you can have subgroups within, within groups, which is what we did in that form I was showing you. Um, so the instance basically defines the structure of your data, and it's the same structure you get back when a form is submitted. Yes, David? You have references instead of duplicating the same sections? Um, can you have <coughs> references? I think they so, are. So if you have the mail. same section, say, for mail and email or something like that. Um, same kind of questions. That sub subroutines ask. kind of thing. Using I'm not sure. When you come back this out. Is, this is a more complex example than I have actually seen anybody else do. <laughs> <laughs> Although I haven't looked at the, they, they have the open medical record stuff, which is going to be more complicated than this. I just haven't looked at it in detail to see how they did. Um, the binding section, the node set is a reference to the things in the previous instance section. So it's things in the model. And the first line says, name is a string, and it is required. Uh, the next line says, sex is a select <laughs> one, that is, a radio button. And we'll define later on what the selections are. Um, the next line says, female questions are relevant only if the sex question has selected female as the right answer. Oh, so this is sort of helping it walk the tree of questions. It, it helps it walk the, the tree of questions. It skips the subtree. It sets up requirements. It sets up all of those little things that you might be this doing. Is, this is voice XML like. It's a yeah, we're not. Yeah, we're not surprised. Some else look alike. Yeah, um, they flow through them. What's the purpose of the parentheses after true? It's just the way it's done. They're, it's they're using yeah. <laughs> they're using XPath here. This the the selected the true. I mean that's all yes. that's all XPath. So those are just straightforward XPath positions in, yep. uh, without any uh, embellishment. Right. They, they, And then the input section essentially defines controls. So the label talks about what the question is going to be. And that text, which looks suspiciously English-like, is really, of course, the ID. I tend to use the English text with minor modifications as the identifier. It makes things much more readable. Um, and the um, <coughs> In this case, the sex question, I know I dropped the unknown, um, defines two items, male and female, and the value is, is, could be one or two. You know, it could be anything, it's what's going to be sent back. Uh, but the label references the uh, language section, yes. I assume you can assign different values to the items if you if your database says male stored as 304 and female is 305? Um, you know, you, you can do so, you can do so, but whether you can do so, but I think you have to modify the XML. Well, define it here, you can right, say. define it here. Yeah, 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 oh, we can, I mean, here. Value, value could be anything. I mean, you're, you it's don't have just, it. It's just the text that is going to be sent back if that were selected, because when you oh, oh, select so sex, the value of, you know, whatever it says in value is what goes into the sex tag in the data that gets returned. I get it, I get it, I'm sorry. Yeah, sure, obviously, put anything you want there. Right, put anything you want. So, those sections define what you can do, and, of course, Having seen this stuff in action, you realize that no human being would actually want to write all this crap. So there are a couple of tools which have been designed to uh, help you. One of them is Perkforms, which was actually, this was developed to, uh, that's the project. Right. We won't demonstrate forms. Um, it was developed 
by a guy in Kenya to help support the Open MRS project. And by the way, he can use some help. Uh, but it's a very, it's a very nice little GWT tool for doing. Yes. Um, I, I just need to back up at a big picture. You got okay. a browser on the phone, and you got enough memory to run a little server. Why are we re reinventing the world of forms and data entry? We've solved this problem already before. Why, why don't we just talk to why a local don't, host? Why don't, why don't we just use the browser? Um, As it gets bigger, you're claiming the running can run servers. Yeah, that's what we just said in this room, but they haven't actually done that yet. Limited so. uh, connectivity, right? I mean, well, well, right. You you right, exactly. Local exactly. To local that host, that too. might be the major. Um, I mean, come on. I mean, that, that XML there, I mean, that X data entry of a building of a form, we did that, you know, 10 years ago. So I'm just wondering why they chose that path. And you want to go to HTML, why? It's there, it works, it's on the phone. Yeah. No, you want to be in the browser to do what the browser does. This is wants to be on the phone to do what the phone does, which is different than what the browser does. This is this is using it as a rich client browser. Right, that, that, that's what my question is. Why, why go with a rich client? The rich client, if because it has less capabilities than browser. Well, connectivity. Offline storage. Yeah, right. yeah, but you're talking to a, connecting to the yeah, local host. Yeah, if you're connecting to the local host for an app server or something. So we can do that because the uh, ODK stuff runs, has browser, has uh, server based versions of it. Oh, so it does? It does? ODK is bigger than uh, these phones. ODK is. is yeah, there's a server. ODK is. Oh, wait. It's not the, that big. Uh, it's, in a, it's, in a, you know, it's an app. The, uh, the 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 X forms is can can run on a server, so you could do X forms yeah. using the same XML, you, 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 not ODK, but uh, X forms. You could do X forms, and once again, X, X forms are kind of one of the issues is it is a cell phone. It's it's not it's not a browser, and yeah, it, you have you you're going to have limited <coughs> screen space, and you have to recognize that things that two or three key for a little web server, you know. Uh, we're not talk we're not talking about memory, we're talking about screen space. The point is uh -oh. laying out a screen on a cell phone and having it behave well is not the same thing as laying out a screen on a browser on your desktop where you've got lots of space and the entire uh, yeah, Steve, so. well, I wouldn't say we do our so. development in the, in the browser in, a, in an iframe that simulates the iPhone. Oh, but, but, but see, the next form says there's 20, 50 fields. So that's going to render as something you got to scroll around on on the iPhone. Oh, you just do the multiple ODK, pages. You just well, do multiple pages. Yeah, just do That's multiple reworking pages. the form. I think you're ODK like, says this whole form I will deliver one question at a time. There, so it's a, it's a way to put it on the screen without you having to. It's a, it's a, you can't do that in the browser and, and have that. Well, there are, there are, there are usability reasons, and also I would say, you know, yeah, that model will makes work for the page. same reason you have bad desktop applications, but not servers distributed. I mean, for that browser. XML could push AWT, you know, out the front, you know? I mean, we've already solved these problems, so I don't, I don't, I don't get it why they're going on something. You're compiled out to like a series 6. What, you're complaining there's more than one solution? Look at that list over there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on. <laughs> I don't know, I'm just asking, okay? Uh, uh, I, total I, control I, of the did, I, did, I, did, <coughs> I did not make the decision. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I wasn't in the room when it was made, so I can't. No, I mean, no that just hundreds of millions of handsets that can run this. Every right. Day. Right. At like yes. less than fifty retail. But they have jobs. Probably only there's probably only a few, costing hundreds of dollars, five hundred dollars. Uh, they could actually run the entire stack. So you're working with sixteen k. Yeah, look at yeah. So you're looking right. you're targeting twelve dollar phones, not right. six hundred dollars smartphones. Okay. Right. So maybe in five years. Okay, I see. It'll all trickle down. And right. you're not talking running just the web server. Um, you'd have to run the server container in the back end, whatever you want to use for your engine. Well, yeah, he's got a little engine running, right? It could be sitting behind. <coughs> Anyways, they're solving the problem of the browsers, and pretty much every phone I've seen has a browser, and it gets updated and maintained. So why are we butts with anything else? That's my question. But that's okay. You own the screen. That's what we do. That's what we do in CS. Yeah. Yeah. What? What? You want to talk to me? Maybe you can reinvent the phone. So he's too good. Yeah. Okay. Um. So I'm going to show you, just because I can, what you know. My solution to the problem was relatively simple, which is I said. 
So why don't I just annotate a Java class and then write a tool which uses reflection to go build the form? So I said I can have some very simple rules. You know, I can annotate a maximum field length. Then there's a, there's a you can limit you can limit strings. Sex is an enum, an enum, and if I see an enum, I know that I want a radio button. <coughs> if I see a value which is an array of enums, I know that I want a multiple select. And um, <coughs> I can generate most of my question names, but if you have a, um, I guess I'll show you the one that, thanks, all right. That's all my that's all my language stuff. Uh, no, no, that was that wasn't the Java class anyway. That was so. And then in turn, if you have a uh, if you have a field which represents a class, treat it as a group. And uh, if you have a list, if you have a generic list. Treat it as one of those child things where it will repeatedly ask you for values and then just generate all of the, everything that you're going to need. Essentially what you've done is set up the structure of the data that you want and added a few annotations to give you the questions that go with it. And when you get done and you get the XML back, pushing it back into that class will be quite simple and then you can do whatever so that's my solution. There are others that are, look more like GUI tools, but I'm a Java developer. I don't, you know, I don't need a GUI system. I can just write Java code and let my compiler find all my errors. And by the way, when I get the answer, I wanted a job anyway. So that was my solution. Um, a little bit on ODK aggregate now. Once you generate a form, you can send it to a tool. In this case, I'm running on uh, the Google App Engine, and you can simply upload a form to the tool, and it will come in and register as a particular form in turn, if the phone, and the phone just has to be configured to talk to this server. So if the phone is talking to this server, what the phone will do is the phone can download any form that you upload to this application. And when the phone gets some data, it will upload it. And then any submissions that you get can be viewed or Real server, and you don't want it running on the phone because you don't want to visit the central repository of submittals on somebody's phone. Yeah. Right. That's somewhere this else. Is, this is a real server. Now you can download it as CSV, open it up in Excel, um, look at the XML that goes with the form, and this is this is the this is the form that I happen to be using, which I've uploaded, and. Um, this represents a central repository for your data. And essentially, I didn't have to do anything to this application. The only thing I had to do to the application to deploy it is to tell it what the name of, what my name on the Google App Engine is and what my password was to deploy it on, on Google App Engine. So they give you a lot With of The jars you put here where you did not have to configure a darn thing? No, no. The, the app server is already running. You just give it what you want it to run. Right. Oh, no, for yeah. this app, not for Google App yeah. Engine. But for, for, for this one, the sources are completely there. They're we ready to, to build, it, build it, deploy it. If someone calls them with a form, that, right. or you hit the right pages, you now define a form. And I don't have any. If I have to find a form, I can upload it to this place and deploy it to phones. Any Anybody, phone any phone that this. calls this and knows right. the best. So are the forms automatically loaded, downloaded the next time they get connectivity? Uh, what happens is the next time they get connectivity, one of the things that you have here, let's see if I can go back, doing the application, is, um, let's see if that's on the menu. Okay, 
on the menu you have server preferences, and yeah, they even have the right server. So, um, I believe that in Manage Files, Download Forms, right, Remote. I'm going to the remote server, I'm fetching a list of forms, and then I can download any one that I can. And this is that the user picks the right ones? The user picks the ones he's interested in. Probably there aren't very many on any particular server. We assume this is going to work. It even works on my phone. Um, is there some sort of versioning that you can tell if the form was updated? I think so, but I don't know. I haven't tried multiple versions. trouble talking to the remote server today. So, where do we use this stuff? Um, this is one of the developers uh, getting some user feedback. Um, one of the main things is that they're using this for HIV counseling. And in this case, they're actually scanning barcodes, which is one of the things that the forms can do and uploading the data into a phone and <coughs> the largest HIV, well you can read this, the largest HIV program is doing testing, counseling, and sending people out with hundreds of phones to follow up on lots and lots of people with HIV. And then they're using the open medical record system, which I'm going to show you in just a little bit. Um, another application is they're using sending people out to phones in Amazon <laughs> to survey trees in the Amazon, and they actually have a survey which talks about the tree diameter and the density and the species of trees, and they're tracking what's happening in the Amazon jungle. Um, so the logging industry knows where to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, the GPS would at least tell you where you are. Yeah, the only good tree is a stump. <laughs> yes. Um, this is this is collecting feedback on um, phones in in Uganda. Yeah, you can read that. Uh, this is a very interesting application. After the earthquake in Haiti, they had. 200,000 people killed and lots of people separated from their families and you had no idea where your relatives were and so an NGO took the technology and developed a people finding site. Uh, these are some of the numbers of people that they've logged and if you go to this site and you are looking for somebody named John. It will list various people who have been reported or who haven't been reported as missing or have been reported as found. And it can enable you to uh, find your loved one who's uh, somewhere in the rubble of Fort uh, Prince. So they've been doing this. What were the numbers on the previous page? Missing people or people that had been entered in the system? Um, <coughs> I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure. Let's uh, see. I think people who have been entered into the system at various locations. But I'm not, again, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. And that was an app that worked on a phone? The entry worked on the phone, the server, you know, they were talking to uh, an app based on the server which found the people, but they were out there with phones finding people, you know, at this GPS location, I have this person and, you know, this is the information, you know, this is the information that I have on So, so most of this data was sourced off the phones into this system. Right, yeah. sourcing off from off, off the phones into the system. And it was put together on very short notice after the earthquake occurred. I mean, they were running within days after the earthquake happened. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and you know, this just shows some of the other applications. You know, a number in Africa, war crimes is an interesting uh, application. School attendance in India. And open MRS is not quite an ODK application, although they have an ODK input. But it's very much the same technology. It's a medical record system, largely homegrown, coming out of developers in Africa. And um, it allows you, it's a pretty good medical record system. I think I should just demo it. You have all the link, right? I've given Nimrod the slides, but it wasn't going to email them. But I'll, the slides will have all of the necessary links. I think I'm already logged in. So we can. It's pretty open, but you have to use a link for the admin. Yeah, they give you, but this is, this is not the real site. And as you discover when you find that there are a lot of patients, but they don't look like real patients. But this is, these are, you know, there are, these are various patients called Jane. Now you can bring up appropriate data on the patient. Most of them don't have any data, which is unfortunate. But you can bring up encounters, demographics, you know, the standard things you would expect from a medical record. And you can enter enter all of this stuff. So this is, you know, in this country we would use a system from uh, GE Medical, which used to be uh, IDX, which used to be famous, which I used to work for, uh, which Know, would be a $20 million system, but they don't have that kind of money. So this is this is a pretty effective system. It will add the HIPAA compliance and it will be there. <laughs> and um, but there are some other efforts. Uh, Paul is going to talk a little bit about where he works. Okay, so uh, about the same time Steve was laid off, I was laid off also. I recently gotten into this same business, and um, so we've uh, we've all heard of uh, Bill Gates and his efforts to uh, eradicate malaria and some huge company over in Ballard called PATH. Uh, turns out there's an NGO that's uh, partially at the University of Washington called iTech. Uh, I'd never heard of it until six weeks ago myself. Uh, International Training Education Center for Health. Do you, do you have the uh, the slides of uh, the, next slide. the other? What's that? It's the next slide. Oh, okay. And um, so they're, this is their bullet points of, of what they claim to do. Uh, health, workforce development, operations, research, and evaluation, prevention, care, and treatment of infectious diseases, and health systems uh, strengthening. And you're probably wondering, where's, where's the Java? Um, so uh, we, we quickly, uh, you know, this, this quote was one link away from their front page, what we do, what they do, and uh, there's um, local laboratories and services re reliable, consistent, and readily available. All of a sudden we start talking about bringing business infrastructure to elect uh, medical laboratories and, uh, and centers. And then we, uh, we uh, so we start talking about MRS systems and LIM systems. That's uh, medical record systems and laboratory information systems. Uh, when you're doing large scale uh, uh, malaria or AIDS programs, um, and you're spending billions of dollars, uh, those pictures Steve showed uh, before of people writing things on uh, on accounting paper is just not going to cut it when you're trying to coordinate across uh, you know, millions of people. So, uh, oh, is this your, uh, so, I think I lost, I think I lost one of your pictures, yes. Where, no, where am I going? No, I, I, I think I lost your picture, I'm sorry. You might have to hit the link. Yeah. No, those are just extra slides that I'm not gonna use. <laughs> Don't come on. Okay, uh, <laughs> the, this, the, the, okay. Uh, the other slideshow. I, uh, I lost it, I'm sorry. I, would, would you get there if you click on, on this? No, no, no. No? That's, that's the actual iTech, uh, the, you know, 
Billy R website. All right. Which doesn't seem to reference Java at all. So. Uh, all right. You had oh, there's your picture. Yeah, that's the thick one. Thing. All right. So there's right. the. Okay. Uh, just tell us what it would have shown. Tell us what it would have shown. I'm sorry, you only sent me... So but to be clear, you're saying so Bill Gates uses Java. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> just trying to get over. Okay, uh, Pal. Well, uh, anyway, I, 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 we want to, so they're doing a lot of things in a lot of places, but uh, iTech is, is, uh, has like 800 employees around the world. Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's a noticeable uh, NGO. And uh, I work for a group called um, CERG. Clinical Informatics Research Group, which is uh, in a sense uh, uh, a subcontractor for iTech doing these health training. So most of the people, if you went over there and looked at iTech, you would see uh, nurse trainers and doctor trainers and clinical uh, process trainers and and uh, public health uh, people uh, trying to do studies and uh, and then software that goes along with that and. Guess what? That's written in. Well, what, oh, you, I, you lost one of my slides. Uh, that said, Open MRS, which is exactly the same one he was just talking about, which is used all over Africa. And do you have the other slideshow that I sent you? Uh, maybe. The uh, the other email, the one with the uh, the pictures of the. Uh... No, but I have my Gmail account here. Oh yeah. Okay. So um, the. Uh, I was, I was uh, asking the guys, uh, the, the system administrators, how, how they do their uh, deployment. And he says, as an appliance. Now, you remember Steve said that um, you can't count on the, the training and the literacy and, the, and people know what they're doing. Turns out that most of the labs this stuff is going into are pretty sophisticated medically. They're, they're the national capital city labs doing testing. They know what to do when it comes to, to running the chemistry. But typing it in a computer, they just sort of, well, I don't know, it just goes in there and disappears. And, uh, and uh, if you, um, if you um, uh, give them a PC and uh, run the server on it, running open MRS and open Ellis, and it's running uh, as a PC, someone starts using it. And it ends up with a virus on it because the viruses aren't been updated and the system goes uh, goes down. Uh, they they have been working really hard at uh, at uh, Debian distributions that are headless that you plug in, you turn on, everything comes in over the network wire and nobody touches anything. So it runs like a toaster. Here is your medical record system. Use it. And it's all in, in a box. It's a medical system in a box. And it's uh, it's pretty interesting that way. So it's it's uh, you know so it's open source from the from the you know down on the metal up all the way to the top, which is pretty pretty cool that uh, uh, they, the systems run that way. Did you did you get to the oh, Gmail? No, it, it won't let me in. Uh, it the, the, connectivity. the system they're doing is it, it's actually the server, or is it still running across the internet? Now the, the the stuff that we're uh, for example the stuff I'm working in is a is a is a laboratory information system so it's it's PCs in the lab talking to a server just like you would have in in, in any laboratory whether it's uh, one of his genetic laboratories or some places I've I've worked before or or um, or in these uh, these uh, uh, state labs in uh, um, in uh, the Ivory Coast and Ken, um, and Haiti. One of the, um, if, if he had the other uh, slideshow presentation, I, which I'm, which I'm looking for. Uh, I downloaded. I, I sent to him this afternoon. Of course, I sent it to you at like 4:30, Steve. What's your problem here? <laughs> I asked for two weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, no, so he was mentioning con connectivity. Right when I started working there, uh, somebody gave a presentation on not on the data upload stream that was coming, but on the map they had thrown together on Google Maps of the who is still online after the earthquake in Haiti because the systems we wrote are deployed in, in Haiti um, and they had gone on a field trip there they had gone on a uh, you know on, in the field in January and then the, the, the earthquake hit 
So one of the things they're doing is not just these lab systems, not just the MRS system, but some public health uh, tracking of some studies. So the question was, how many labs are still in operation? How many people can still tell us in the, uh, in the similar to his uh, forms upload kind of thing, um, that they're still alive? And it, uh, there was a, it was like 40% of them, and most of them were outside of Port-au-Prince. You know, that is, it's usually the other way around. The capital city's got folks running all the time, and the labs off in little towns, there, you know, they come, they go. Well, their statistics were still come, go, come, go but the whole capital city was gone off the map, you know, the, the major hospitals and things. So it's a very, um, very strange uh, statistic to see there. Um, I, uh, I'm currently working on uh, a port of Open Limbs to, or uh, Open Ellis, which is a, a companion open source project, or not a companion, another open source project that runs the laboratory information systems that is being deployed in uh, uh, Ivory Coast or as I've learned to call it, uh, Côte d'Ivoire, because that's the official name of Ivory Coast is in French all the time. Um, the, uh, the, uh, some interesting things there is that you, you heard Steve's uh, description of uh, literacy and training and support. Uh, I already mentioned the, the toaster model of, of systems. Uh, the other thing is, it's a lot like writing software for your grandmother. You, you know, uh, well, we want to do Web 2.0 and pop-ups and floating uh, info boxes and all this kind of stuff. That's what, we, that's, that's what we're doing these days, right? Well, not so much if, well, if you've ever done any medical lab systems, they're usually pretty boring anyway, but this is even more, more boring, you know, the things that uh, disappear and pop back in. It, it's, it's just not a uh, they're not used to it. I mean, I'm sure their their kids, uh, are, you know, hanging out in the internet cafes down in town are going to be uh, as savvy as, as our kids on the internet. But right now, the, the the nurses and the technicians and the doctors, they're looking at we're looking at uh, things that feel a little older uh, in the, the way the the HTML works and the way that the forms are, you know, how how tricky they are and stuff. So, on some of these uh, open source projects and tools that you're working with. So the audience, like you said, is maybe not that sophisticated. What about the actual architecture and stack? Can you talk a little bit about that? They, um, like any uh, stack of software, you know, some of it has got to be the, you know, oh my God, you just want to kill the guys who wrote it, you know, and, uh, you know. Um, uh, open limbs, open uh, Ellis, I should say, uh, the enterprise laboratory information system that it is, uh, was put together by combination of medical folks and research PhDs and software engineers and it for example uses hibernate and but it uses uh, struts so it's sort of really old on the front and not too bad in the uh, for the database writing uh, I say not too bad because if you look closely all the HBM note annotations and things are not annotations but the XML files are um, not fully connected on the entire database structure. So you're not really leveraging, getting all the work out of Hibernate to do, you know, to follow all the links for you. You do a lot of... Uh, good. What's that? That's good. That's good? Of course. It yeah. will kill performance. Yeah, right yeah, yeah. I mean, right, there's all kinds if of... you follow all, all the structure, all the links, yeah, yeah. I mean, you got to do it right. If you start following, you know, lazy load and who's in charge of the, the collections, and and you get, you know, there's there's stuff. But but not just the simple. They don't even do the simple ones of, of the, the, you know, here's a identifier that points at these, you know, uh, other record. It, it's um, I, I would say it's a you know sort of a beginner use of, of Hibernate. So maybe it's like more of a framework than they need to to read my these files. To read my, but they, you know, it's it works. So you know. Um, I'm sorry, he didn't have the other presentation, but uh, there were pictures uh, from Haiti and Ivory Coast, or uh, mostly from Ivory Coast, of a recent field trip. And one of the, co uh, the contrasts you see is the pictures of the wires and things like that, and people on the street with baskets on their head and stuff like that. But then, boom, pictures in the laboratory of the modern instruments. And one of the things that happens in any limb system is grabbing data off of a smart or not so smart or thought to be pretty smart so they didn't need to communicate with anything uh, machine. I don't know if you've ever worked in, 
in labs, but the, the, every machine thinks that it's solved the world's problems and, and it doesn't need to download its data to, these, to their, their main system. Um, Steve will find that working in his uh, genetics. Oh, he's not actually working in the lab, but uh, you know they, uh, they want to charge you a lot for these machines, so they're trying to be all so smart. But when you really integrate them in the laboratory, is you don't give a crap what the machine does and whether it has a database on it. You want that test to run and get the data off the machine into the central database. And um, so that's a, that's a challenge that we'll be uh, looking into. Um, and that comes in handy there because then you can write Java for whatever um, machine that uh, you, you got a connection there. Look, no, look at this. Now oh, you got a connection here. Now I got a connection. Uh, is this off third world? Uh, <laughs> it, only, it only feels like third world. Wi-Fi? Yeah, up there, up there. Oh, that one. No, that, that's... Where's the other one? I don't see the other one. No, you the just take... One. The Where's the next one? This one. The next message, P. Hill. Steve, I don't have a flash drive. No. <laughs> it's a lovely interface, don't you? Have, people have been <laughs> kicking me for the last uh, oh. month as I... Uh, I didn't realize there was a second message. Yeah, 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 every, I, every time I, every time I reply in Gmail, I... I it's never hit reply all. Have, have you all skipped reply all being yeah. hidden underneath the to the right, right or right. you have to click another time to get reply all? Right that that right. Yeah, that right, <laughs> web tool interface. It's just like I, I, nobody complained that I never hit reply all on a, on a you know on a. On a while, we're, while we're downloading this, there's a labs. There, 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 there's a summary slide which essentially says what I've been saying. Uh, the third, you know, computing can make a big difference in the third world. We've got some very active programs, and you can get involved with the change group or by looking at ODK or Java Rosa, contributing both time and code. And these are links that you can follow if you want to do so. And maybe with that, we can bring up your slides. Maybe. Hey, um uh, oh, uh, if, if you uh, uh, search around on uh, OpenMRS, you'll, you'll see, uh, as Steve mentioned, the, uh, the cell phone integration on uh, the laboratory systems. One of the things the laboratory systems are doing is supporting a lot of, of uh, major studies out in the field. A lot of these public health funding is, is um, tracking tuberculosis to malaria or AIDS or whatever, and it really comes down to information to a lab where they're running tests on people's blood. Um, and, um, and so the laboratory system uh, ends up having a mini uh, patient record system in it, and, but it, has an extent, it needs an extensive demographic information. So th this is a presentation that was given a month ago by this research group. Um, to the other people at the uh, at the med center, who are like, what are you guys doing? Because it's all software for people outside the, the um, uh, outside the uh, uh, outside the university and the med center. So uh, the, uh, notice home case management because they're, they're talking about forms, which is what Steve was just talking about. Um, the uh, Computerized patient reported outcomes. That's that's the open uh, MRS, um, the uh, H HIV treatment, and that that's the lab system. Um, the uh, uh, this is, gives you some si uh, concept of the size of the group that I'm talking about, which is different than the group Steve was talking about. Lots of uh, interaction with people. Um, half the group, by the way, does work domestically and collect up uh, data. Uh, uh, not a third world uh, problem, but public health information, the University of Washington is involved in, um, in a lot of rounding up of, uh, of information. To, uh, there was an article on the cover of, of uh, page one of the New York Times about a month ago. Some guy from NIH was talking about, you know, here's how H1N1 worked out. Here's the little graph of how it spread around the, uh, the nation. Well, those are the guys at UW collected that stuff up and um, 
And you, if you think the third world's uh, got lack of connectivity, as far as I can tell, state health departments have a lot of lack of connectivity, judging from the guys I've talked to and the cubes open for me. So um, they, there's a lot of uh, higher level management training of, of uh, developing of, uh, of, uh, of things, but then you end up with, that's where the software comes in. And uh, this, a lot of this kind of stuff is, uh, turns out to be the non-job stuff. So um, in global health, this, there's where the deployments are. There's uh, Haiti, uh, Ivory Coast, uh, Namibia, uh, that's actually Mozambique and, and uh, Ethiopia, and uh, Vietnam. It turns out Open Ellis is uh, uh, a major contributor to the project is in uh, Vietnam. Open Ellis was developed by the state labs, the University of Minnesota and the University of Iowa to do what state labs do in, uh, in uh, the United States. And that's, you know, people send in samples and they get tests for, you know, paternity or TB or HIV or whatever the, you know, the trick tests are that you need a state lab to do. So, um, so here's that contrast picture I was, I was talking about. Smart machine, PC connected, some kind of uh, you know uh, control from it, and uh, that's uh, I believe the parking lot of one of those buildings. So uh, it's uh, you know the the, uh, the infrastructure drops off quickly. So these are some just some tourist shots to give you some idea of uh, um, that's uh, the the guy who gets all our money, the the doctor who's the primary investigator. This is all soft money if you know what that means. Uh, shots, just much like Steve's, of examples of uh, old school, the way the data is done. Not um, necessarily old computer technology, but but uh, in this case, uh, you know, marker boards. Um, the, uh, we go back to this picture, main laboratory in the capital city. Field laboratory. I think you can see the difference, even if you don't know what a health lab looks like. That there's somehow that that one is uh, maybe is a place for a phone app where you can enter some data and send it into the into the main lab. Uh, more contrasts of clinics. Apparently, that was one of the clinics. Um, I think there was a picture somewhere of a woman with a large basket on her head, and that was interesting. Health infrastructure. It was a, a pill lady. She um, has prescriptions in a basket, and the doctor writes you a prescription, and you wait for her to come by, and she pulls out a bottle and sells you the right stuff. And if she doesn't have it, she comes by next time with the right, with uh, hopefully the right stuff. These are shots of Namibia. Everybody point that one out at a map. I already did, but even now, you probably like Namibia. Which part of Africa is that in? <laughs> So um, the, one of the things I said after I started working there is these are not third world countries where this software is running. These are undeveloped countries. They're not in third place of anything. These are, this is in, in uh, you know, a Latin American country that's c coming up in the world. This is you know, uh, Ivory Coast and, uh, and um, you know, Haiti, which for, you know, everybody knows that's one of the poorest in the Western Hemisphere. Um, it's various um, uh, software uh, uh, being talked about here. That's you know lots of project management going on that you're, you know we're all used to. Um, I'm not sure this is of that much interest to us. Um, mobile application for uh, something about uh, HIV in, in Haiti. Uh, so there, there was this. They've already been doing some apps using the same technology Steve was talking about, um, and. Uh, Again, there was, there was another app involved in uh, infrastructure assessment. These were tools for the uh, the path or the iTech people, the, the the NGO folks, to to uh, send back information about what's going on. When they see one of those field hospitals, one of those field clinics in the dirt field, they uh, they're they're not using tra nurses trained to use a phone, but themselves to write down information and send it in. Um, uh, the woman works uh, two cubes over from me. She went down to Haiti on a trip that was already scheduled. It was a couple weeks after the quake. She went 100% self-contained. That's her food, as well as uh, what she was doing down there. Um, <laughs> that 
she was taking shots of uh, you know lines up of people. You know this was this was weeks in. If you recall, it was um, you know you know holy cow. You know go down there talking about their you know you have a meeting with the customer on site and talking about you know what the next phase of the project is and and then, um, half the hospitals weren't online so. <laughs> And she wasn't, uh, you know, involved in relief efforts. These were just shots she was able to take because they were it's all, was, you know, nearby and on the streets. Um, the uh, the woman who uh, let me borrow this uh, slideshow uh, said that uh, in substitute for this, I should say that uh, there uh, she's willing to entertain uh, resumes from uh, folks who are looking to do a little job of work if. Uh, um, they, uh, she thinks, uh, you know, I don't know where the money comes from. I think where there was some discussion about that, but uh, I was willing to entertain folks and uh, give us a call. Um, it's been very interesting to me to see how much the open source software uh, is leveraged in, in this operation. And uh, as Steve said, it's uh, sort of a different application than, than we're used to in the Java world. So the point is, Java can make a big difference not only in this country but throughout the world, and there are lots of projects that learn, that need exactly the skills of the people in this room. And we'll post the slides which have all of the uh, critical links. Okay, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. I guess if you guys have any questions, just come up and ask. Otherwise, uh, we'll just meet for, meet for beer. beers. Let's do that. Good night. <laughs>